Welcome to the Adorama Live Theater here at CBS Radio New York. I'm Tim Scheld from WCBS News Radio 880, and I'm privileged and honored to welcome an audience full of veterans of Vietnam, of Afghanistan, uh, of Iraq, and a terrific panel of uh, folks here who will have a conversation about veterans with veterans. And the jumping off point of this event is all about a very special film that's coming out, a 10 part film that's coming out on PBS on Sunday. Uh, the Vietnam War, which is a epic, landmark, 10-year-long project, uh, a labor of love by two people behind me, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, uh, filmmakers extraordinaire. Uh, I read uh, Ken, and I've heard him say that history is malleable. Well, and history is also a collage of colors when you include stories. There are so many stories in this room that I hope we get to hear from. But the more stories you hear about history, the different places that that malleable history gets you to. And that's what this film does. And hopefully it opens up some conversations. So I welcome uh, them here today. Our panel is um, hosted by our own WCBS News Radio 880 anchor, Steve Scott, and I will give it to him and hear your questions a little later on. As well, if you have questions on Facebook Live, we're very excited to answer some of those as well. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. And again, welcome to the veterans who we have in the room today and the veterans and others watching via Facebook Live across the country and around the world. We do look forward to hearing from you. Uh, let's meet our uh, guest today. Tim already uh, mentioned that we have Ken Burns and Lynn Novick here. They are the filmmakers, uh, the genius behind the Vietnam War, and we welcome them and thank them for being here today. Thank you. Moving across to the other side, we have uh, Zach Iskell, who is a, an Iraq War veteran, and he is the founder of Headstrong. We'll be hearing more about Headstrong. Zach, welcome. <laughs> Vietnam veteran and vice president of the Vietnam Veterans Association, Marsha Four is here. Marsha, welcome. <laughs> and Vietnam veteran, Dr. Roger Harris. Dr. Harris, welcome. Now, as Tim mentioned, this is more than just about the film, The Vietnam War. This is a conversation, but we do want to set it up, and we have uh, some clips from uh, the documentary that we're going to be watching. Uh, Ken, we want to set up, and, and Lynn, the, set up this first clip that we're going to be watching. Sure. We're so honored to be here today. You know, one of the important things we want to be able to say, well, often, and we said it before, thank you for your service, and that's a, an appropriate thing at any moment. Often that's the end of the conversation, not the beginning of the conversation. And so in a way, one of the many, many things we'd like to have come out of this film is a big welcome home. A lot of people, I think, particularly a lot of Vietnam vets, seem to have come home alone and didn't have the parades, but also didn't have a general societal welcome. And, and, and what we'd like to see is welcome home and how can we help you. And we're so pleased to be partnering today with all these extraordinary people to be able to, to do that. So I'd like to introduce the first clip we've been following throughout the, the series of uh, several Marines and Army guys and many vets uh, from, from every stripe and experience, uh, but no two more in, intensely than uh, a, a Marine from Missouri named John Musgrave and also Roger Harris. Um, he's in it, and this is a clip towards the end of our, our sixth episode when this question of coming home and who welcomes you becomes a, a question not only for a returning vet, but a returning vet who happens to be African-American, who's struggled coming out of the Roxbury neighborhood in Boston, sort of fighting and squabbling with uh, folks from the all-white South Boston, but finding when you got to Vietnam that uh, the Viet Cong and the NVA didn't distinguish between the color of the skin. They were the enemy. And so we're just going to pick up with uh, a post-Tet moment when Roger Harris, one of the most extraordinary and brave human beings I've ever met and now happy to count as a friend, um, tries to come home. I land in California, take a plane from California to Boston, and I'm feeling good because uh, I've survived and, you know, fought for my country. And I got off the plane at Logan, and I stepped out there, and I'm just happy to be home. And um, I have my uniform on. 
and walked out to the curb. And the cabs just kept going by me. Kept going by me. And there was a state trooper that was standing there. And I, I didn't realize what was happening. And then he stepped in the street, and he stopped the cab. And he says, you have to take this man. You have to take this soldier. And the driver looked over at me, and he said, I don't want to go to Roxbury. They don't see me as a soldier. You know, they see me as a nigga coming, you know, and I live in Roxbury, <laughs> you know. I'm thinking, I'm a Marine. I'm a Marine. You know, I just fought for my country 13 months in a combat zone, and I can't get a cab to get home. Take us back. Was that... What a slap in the face and, and welcome to reality. Yes, and... and... <laughs> To put it in context, you know, it was 1968 and uh, probably the height of the civil rights movement. And at the time, Boston was very racially segregated and African-Americans and Latino folks in Boston lived in just a couple of neighborhoods, the South End, Roxbury, and parts of Dorchester. And um, um, the city was very divided as the country was. And, um, you know, being in... Vietnam for 13 months, you don't really think about that. You know, once in a while, you know, folks would remind us what was happening back home. But as a soldier, you think that you know, you're concentrating on, on surviving, on getting home, and everything is about getting home, hoping that you make it home. And, um, and then to come home and the reception being uh, cabs just going, taxis going by you and a state trooper having to stop. And, and I remember I remember when he said it. He said, I don't want to go to Roxbury. I remember thinking, how does he know I live in Roxbury? You know, and then it hit me. And it was, just, it was sad. But, you know, that was uh, not just for me. For a lot of African Americans that came home, they had um, those types of welcomes and even worse in some cases. I was, I, was, I mean, do you, would you talk a little bit more about just coming home having left the combat zone, there wasn't a lot of buffer between getting on an airplane and landing at Logan. No, and what no. was that like? It's just like, talk well, to your well one, day, and... one day, one day, one day you're in Vietnam, uh, and plane from Da Nang would take you to Okinawa, Okinawa to LA, and basically 24 or 36 hours later, uh, you're home. So there was no transition, you know? And so... <clears throat> The, the, the transition is on a plane, airport, airport, home, you know, um, and, and, you know, it was just shocking and, and disturbing, you know, discouraging, you know, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad but truthful commentary on our country and what was happening at that time. You had 13 months over there where there, in essence, there wasn't racism. You were all one team. And then you come home to your country, and you get that slap. It, that that had to be shocking. Well, interesting thing, and and I think it's in the in the book, uh, and and in one of the other episodes. Um, you know, in, in Boston, African Americans lived in Roxbury, Irish Catholics lived in South Boston, and from the time I was a little kid, you know, you just hear the stories about you can't get caught in South Boston, and South Boston is where the beach is. You can't go to the beach, you know, and and um, so you grow up, you know, realizing that, you know, folks from South Boston are the enemy, and they grew up thinking that folks in, in Roxbury are the enemy. <laughs> and I ended up in Vietnam, and I had Boston Roxbury on my helmet. And this guy walked up to me and he said, you're from, you're from Boston, Boston? I said, yeah, I'm from Boston. And he said, I'm from Boston, too. I said, where are you? What part of Boston are you from? He said, South Boston. And then we both looked at each other. I said, I'm from Roxbury. And we looked at each other for a couple of minutes like, now what? You know, but uh, we became we became good friends and, and shared food, shared some of the atrocities and, and the tragedies. And it was it was crazy over there. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we promised each other that we'd connect when we got home, but it didn't happen. And then um, years later, you know, I had, when I got back, I was fortunate. I spent a year at Quantico, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to go to school. And uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree and started teaching in 1974 
and in 1974 in Boston, that was the um, first year of desegregation. The federal judge ordered that the schools uh, uh, become desegregated, and so they were bustling black and Latino kids into predominantly white neighborhoods. And I got assigned as a first-year teacher to Hyde Park High School. And so the three most explosive high schools in, in the city at the time were South Boston, Charlestown, and Hyde Park High. And so I got assigned to Hyde Park High School. And just like the newspapers and the, the media had hyped it up all summer, uh, when school opened up in September, there were crowds of folks from the neighborhood who were, you know, throwing bricks and bottles at buses and yelling and screaming and, you know, and trying to attack the kids getting off the buses. And there was a lot of fights, fights out in the front of the school on the steps. And uh, the mayor had sent police over to the school, you know, to protect the kids and, and the staff. And this one particular morning, you know, there was a big um, tussle out there and a lot of pushing and then fighting. And, and uh, the headmaster was on the on the uh, loudspeaker telling everybody to pull. <laughs> I was like, pull back, pull back. <laughs> you know? And um, and people were rushing to school. And and um, I bumped into somebody, you know, and it was a, it was a police officer. <laughs> and I turned. It turned out it was my buddy, Jack Joyce, from South Boston. Yeah. And... And, you know, so all this stuff is going on around us and we're hugging each other and laughing and joking. <laughs> and people are looking at, you know, black black man, white man, what's going on here? You know, and we started teasing each other. I said, oh, you're stupid. You know, you're still wearing a gun and a badge. I mean, a, a gun and, and a uniform, right? I said, you're still wearing a uniform and a gun. You know, so he said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a school teacher. I said, I went to college, man. I got a degree. So, uh, so he said... I mean, we were a little more raw than that with each other, <laughs> and and and, um, and so he said, "All right, well, you know, how much money are you making this year?" And I said, "Eleven thousand dollars, man. I have a I have a bachelor's degree. Eleven thousand dollars." He said, "Yeah, well, I'm making twenty-two with a high school diploma." <laughs> you know, and so we're laughing and joking, but everybody's fighting, and you know, we had a ball, but we, we're still friends. We're still friends, and. Um, Together the other evening in in Boston together, and I I thought it quite touching and a sort of sense of what things could become. That from the stage, uh, Roger was able to acknowledge Jack, and you could see the possibilities uh, of reconciliation that we haven't completely done with Vietnam on a big scale, and we haven't necessarily done on an individual scale. But when it happens, and it happens so in a way effortlessly that two human beings recognize their common humanity and their common experience. I felt like we had just leapt over time and into the possibilities that we would all want to have happen for all the veterans coming back. Uh, let's set up our second clip. You want to tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, so um, unfortunately human beings uh, default to war all the time for as long as there have been human beings and I'm a little bit worried that that's the way it's going to be for all of time. Um, soldiers coming home have a really tough time adjusting, not just in the outer ways with jobs or cabs or things like that, but the, the battles that take place uh, inside are as, uh, as important. And a number of the vets who were kind enough to speak in our film have been able to detail this. It's what the Greeks called divine madness in the Civil War. It was called the soldier's heart in World War II. It was called combat fatigue. Uh, but it got a new name in Vietnam, a clinical name that may have been both good news that we knew what it was and it needed to be treated, but maybe bad news because it made it something less poetic and less something that communities could really embrace and love and hold. And so this is from our 10th episode, just a brief moment. Uh, of of us as filmmakers, but also us as people trying to bring veterans home of the decompression of that. So we, yeah, second clip. Yeah, let's go ahead and roll it. I remember I was with one of my daughters uh, in an intersection, and some guy came up behind me and blasted the horn. When I came to my senses, I was on the hood of his car, about to, trying to kick his windshield in. And I went, Gee, and there's people all over looking at me. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. And then I started going, well, this is weird. And I sort of slinked back to my car and, you know, 
my daughter, she's about four, looking at me, wow, what's that all about? And I'm going, what is that all about? I had no idea. I had no idea that it was even related to the war. It is as old as war itself. The ancient Greeks called it divine madness. It was soldier's heart in the Civil War. Shell shock during the First World War. And combat fatigue in the Second. Following Vietnam, it was given a new name. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And what you learn is that PTSD doesn't go away. But now if someone honks the horn and it startles me, I'm still, my heart rate's still gonna go up and it'll be there for five minutes and I'm like this, but 10, nine, it's just some asshole who's had a bad day at work, eight, seven, six, it's not, no one's shooting at you, you're safe, it's seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and I can control it. Whereas I couldn't do it before because I didn't understand what was going on. Adding to the pain many veterans felt was their country's eagerness to forget the war. There were few parades. In many ways, everyone came home from Vietnam alone. When I got home, again, my mom and dad were there, my brothers and sisters, my wife, and were embracing, and I couldn't relate to my wife or my mother what I had seen, what I had done in Vietnam. I could have talked to my brothers about it, but they they knew I didn't want to. And so it just the, something unsaid, you know, welcome back, Vince. Uh, you've been through the, the ringer, but welcome back. Powerful. Um, we're going to be hearing from, uh, from Marsha, who was uh, a nurse, and also from Zach, who uh, founded an organization that helps people dealing with the challenges of coming back. But I, I think this clip from episode 10 really segues nicely into our next clip that, that you call episode 11. And it's a 10-episode uh, show, so explain episode 11, this clip, and what we're going to see here. And then uh, we do want to hear from, from Marsha and Zach. And, and this Roger. is a, a piece that's not actually in our film, but we're releasing it now because we found this moment that we filmed very powerful, and we are excited to share it all with you for the first time it's been seen anywhere. Um, one of the veterans in the film that Ken mentioned earlier, John Musgrave, um, has spent many years working to foster sort of intergenerational conversation to impart the lessons he feels he and other Vietnam veterans have learned about how to come home and how to live with what he's been through uh, with the next generations of soldiers coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan. And so he regularly counsels veterans and active duty soldiers and was at the time we filmed him four years ago, part of a program, very um, small scale, meeting with there were three or four Vietnam vets and a table full of returning soldiers who were really struggling with some of the things that we've just been studying or looking at. Uh, you know, before we started, I would just like to add about John. He's been through the ringer, as Vincent Okamoto's brothers knew his, their brother had been through. He's seen unbelievable combat with Roger Harris up in i Corps, being shelled continuously 24-7, um, losing lots of fellow people. He's himself in an ambush, wounded uh, tremendously. He undergoes, you know, more than a year of operations and convalescence, uh, undergoes uh, a, a radical transformation, but not before he slips uh, down into the depths of depression and has a round chambered in his uh, a pistol and, 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 and fortunately doesn't pull the trigger and has a kind of understanding and begins to climb out of something that he will never be able to fully climb out of. He's already admitted to us that he needs a nightlight because he's so scared of the dark from some of the recon missions he'd done as a Marine and, and that even his kids are saying, how come we have to get rid of our nightlight? Daddy gets to keep his. And um, you, you, you really follow him as well as Roger throughout the film. And, and so there's just an enormous amount of poignancy to, to see that, that, that in the midst of his struggle, one of the ways he understood that he could best help himself, as we can all find in our lives, is helping others. And this, we've created a 20 minute piece, and we're just going to show you a little piece of it. Let's go ahead and roll that.
the most powerful people in the healing process are you guys around the table. Amen. All right, the, 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 the clinical side can, can take it a step farther, but there's, there's absolutely nothing more powerful than, than you guys right here, okay? Um, I'm gonna turn it over to John for the, the last official words here. Life is worth living. Any struggle, it's worth it. We've been through hell already. We don't need to put ourselves through any more hell now that we're home. The enemy that we're struggling with now is as deadly as enemy, any enemy we've ever faced on the field of battle. Only it's inside of us. Kurt said a very important thing about it. It's a day-to-day -day thing. One of the things I used to do at night when I was holding my 45 under my chin was I'd say, John, you know, if you really want to do this, you can do it tomorrow. And I'd put it back in the drawer. And if you have moments like that, or you have buddies who are having moments like that, but just get another day out of it. And then next day, it's like being in the grunts. You put one foot in front of the other. And surviving the war after we come home is putting one day after another until we've got it figured out. I'm so glad that I didn't kill myself when I was 20 years old when I got home from the hospital. I'm so grateful that I put it off all those nights for all those years. You know, sometimes when we struggle with a question, we just have to live ourselves into the answer. I know I could count on any one of you at this table if I needed you. I know I could count on you. I know it. And that's a great feeling. I feel like you were talking uh, directly to me. Because I felt, I felt everything you were talking about. As far as, uh, Feeling like being alone. Uh, I've been, been to a point where I just almost wanted to quit. My dog saved my life. <laughs> yeah. My dog saved me twice. Just I mean, by coming into the room. And licking licking my face while I'm just pouring down in tears. Yeah. Um, so Everything you said, it uh, it hit home. And it helped me out. Thank you. Hey, never surrender, right? Never surrender. Thank you. Thank For you, real. buddy. I took a couple of peeks out into the audience while we're watching that, and I saw some, some heads bobbing, some heads nodding. And, and we'd like to hear your feedback. Tim will have a, a mic out there. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, Marcia Four, who's vice president of the Vietnam Veterans Association, a nurse in Vietnam, did you recognize the stress that, that the soldiers were under at that time? Could, as a medical professional, could you see what was going to happen when they went home? Well, I think we have to look back and consider how old we were at that point in time. I was only 22 years old. Um, nursing in that environment was an overpowering, overchallenged situation for us. We were all under stress. Could we identify that physical part of it as the veteran, as, as the, uh, you know, the wounded came in? For the most part, for myself, no. And in part, it's because most of them were not aware and conscious. 
we didn't have a lot of communication with them. And I was in a must hospital, and so they were in and out as quickly as we could get them. However, there were some in the dead of night when the activity on the unit, and I worked the intensive care recovery room, and the, in, the activity on the unit was at a lull. And although for most of, the, most of the guys, we never knew who they were or where they came from. And quite frankly, we didn't want to remember that. But others were there for more than 24 hours, and we would sit with them at night. And they would talk then, when the lights were low, and talk about having to go home, and who was going to love them when they came home. Who would be able to accept them with no legs and no arms? Who could take care of them they are blind? And to sit and have those conversations and to be able to give them some reason that their life was given back to them and that they had something else to move on to. Those were difficult times. I think, as you mentioned, Ken, too, going through time in different wars, the issue of this mental health crisis. Through time, the terms become more clinical as you move forward to the point now where, in my mind, that's good because now we're seeing it for what it is. It is an issue that has to be addressed. Research can be done. Tools can be developed. It's out in the open. It's no more in the closet. We're not ashamed anymore. And that's a good thing. I know when, when I came home, I was, I felt like I was coming back for, to a different planet. I didn't fit in. None of my friends could understand. And the only support that I had, I mean, other than my family, I knew they loved me, but they couldn't understand. The only people that could understand were other people who had been to Vietnam. And they were the support that most of us tried to seek out. For me, it took quite a while because as a woman veteran, nobody knew I'd been in the war unless I told them I didn't have a GI haircut. And I learned very quickly that most people didn't even really want to hear what I had to say. They couldn't know it. They couldn't feel it. And so they moved on. But eventually, I did find a place where Vietnam veterans were supporting each other, and it was in the organization that I belonged to, VVA. And most Vietnam veterans didn't have a real healthy rep when they came back. <laughs> we had uh, bad reputations, some of us. And nobody really wanted to give us too much attention. And so coming together, we able to have a voice. And we recognized the importance of that, and the founding principle, actually, which really tied us together, was that never again would one generation of veterans abandon another. And that's what has moved us forward from that day to this. You know, I remember my, when I was a little boy, my grandmother uh, would talk about seeing World War I veterans come home, and she'd say there'd always be the guy who was sitting on the porch, who never left the porch, who never spoke, who just had that thousand-yard stare. And when we made our film on World War II, guys would come home, have some trouble. You might see a, a local family doctor, and he says, just act normal and you'll be normal. And of course, that was impossible even then. Of course, it's the same dating back to Greek tragedies. But um, fortunately, particularly people like you make it, it move forward, and we can actually see the kind of progress and the kind of hard work that's being done. I think it was a great point when you talk about as as the names become more clinical, that it's it's come out of the shadows, and um, I don't want to use the word more acceptable to talk about it, but I can't think of a better word at the moment. It's 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 out of the shadows, and and we can talk about it now. And it's important to know that there are organizations and people who can help. There's the VVA, and then there's Headstrong. Zach Iskell, you came back from Iraq. 
and founded an organization to help people who came back from war and struggled. Tell us about Headstrong. Yeah. Um... So there's a lot to unpack here, uh, and I might have to ask you to repeat that question because I've, I've got something else I want to say first, which is, uh, you know, um, I don't know, I hope this doesn't come across as cheesy to all the Vietnam veterans in the room, but I want to thank you guys, not just for answering the call, not just for serving your country, but more importantly for what you guys did afterwards. Um, you guys have paved the road um, for all of us who have come after, and I think there's, uh, when Oliver Stone received his Academy Award for Platoon, he said, if we don't learn the lessons of Vietnam, the 50,000 people we lost would have died for nothing. And we have learned the lessons of your, your war. We've, we've learned lessons from your coming home. Um, I was in 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. Guys in 2-9 wish they were in 3-1. Um, but uh, <laughs> my battalion commander, before we deployed on, on our second deployment to Iraq, we were headed to Al Anbar province in 2004. We knew we would end up fighting in, in Fallujah. Um, he'd always have these old guys from Vietnam and Korea around. And it would drive us. I mean, at first it was great. Those old guys. I'm, 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 I'm almost there now. <laughs> but he would have the. He, he'd have them come to mess dinners. He'd have them at training evolutions. He'd have them talk to us in the field. And at first it was great. And I was like, Sir, what are you doing? You're, you're driving us nuts. This is interrupting training. But my battalion commander was a remarkable guy. He still is. His name's Colonel Willie Buell, and I was lucky to serve under his command. And he was one of those types of leaders who. Um, when he turned over command, he never turned over responsibility for taking care of the men in his command. And he knew something that us younger officers didn't understand, which is that when we needed it, you guys would be there for us. And um, I'm sorry, when, we, uh, when we'd have guys get wounded, um, you guys were the ones that would meet them at the hospital. Um, when we came off the plane, you guys were there to greet us. Um, and it was such a remarkable gift, uh, to our battalion. Um, so for that, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Um, in terms of headstrong, um, there's a lot to impact in some of the stuff that we're talking about. And I think, you know, one of the, the benefits that we have today, and a lot of this is something else that we have to thank Vietnam veterans for is a lot of the treatments that we have today to treat post-traumatic stress were developed in treating Vietnam veterans. And those are not just treatments that we use to treat veterans today. Those are treatments that we use to treat people who are suffering from trauma. And um, those would not have been developed if it was not for people coming home from that war needing that help. And so when Carl Morlantes, who I am a huge fan of, says that this is something he has to live with for the rest of his life, I say this with all due respect, he's wrong. Um, trauma is treatable. And if you get the right help, um, you can recover from this. So we started, my battalion lost uh, 33 Marines in the Battle of Fallujah, about half our battalion was wounded. Um, we've now lost about 23 Marines to suicide. Um, and that became the impetus for starting Headstrong. But I think it's also important to note that there's a suicide epidemic in this country that's beyond veterans. It's the second leading cause of deaths of teenagers. Um, it's the eighth leading cause of death in the US. This is a national problem that is beyond just vets. And my hope is, is that if people see us getting help, if people seeing us getting better, maybe other folks will follow our lead as, as citizens and as leaders. Um, so we founded Headstrong with a very simple mission uh, that we would provide world-class treatment. It had to be completely cost-free, no wait times, no paperwork, and most importantly, it had to be effective. And so we started the program here in New York City with a partnership with Cornell Medical Center on the Upper East Side. Um, we've now expanded to treatment to eight different cities. And in those cities, what we do is we build networks of world-class private practice clinicians um, who provide hours to veterans. All the care is managed by our team at Cornell. We pay the full bills um, and raise the money to pay the bills. Um, but what we have found is when people get the right help, they recover very, very quickly if they can't sleep through the night. Could, could yeah. you just uh, tell us what those cities are and if there is a hotline that you could give, that would right. be super important. I know there are a lot of vets yep. listening and probably a lot of vets in pain, a lot of vets or no people that are in pain and that mm -hmm. we, I, I think it would be really important to get that out. Yeah. I'm sure it's on the website and all of these things are there, but maybe just sure. if you could directly tell us what those cities are so, besides New York. Uh, the easiest way to sign up, it's, it's really simple. You go to getheadstrong.org, uh, getheadstrong.org. You, there's a form on the website, you fill it out, somebody will be in touch with you uh, within a few hours. If not, within 48 hours, usually it's a few hours. 
Um, we're now in New York, uh, Chicago, Houston, Texas, San Diego, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Denver, and Colorado Springs. Uh, we, are, we would love to go to Boston. There's a great program through the home <laughs> uh, that the Red Sox, as a Yankees fan, it hurts me to say that, <laughs> run. So there's less of a need for us in Boston. My wife is from Boston. Um, she's a big fan of Tom Brady. Breaks my heart. Um, <laughs> But we we're, we we're with your wife, by the way. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. A lot of people are. Um, but you go to getheadstrong.org, and uh, there's a small form. Um, somebody will reach out to you. Within a few days, you'll see a psychiatrist, and then we put you into a, a treatment program. All right. We're going to make sure uh, that we have you when we get to the end of the program and everybody says their closing words we, i want you to to give that web address sure. a few more times because obviously we have people coming and going throughout the uh, the course of the program here there were it seems lessons learned from vietnam to the gulf war as far as welcoming home uh the troops i remember as a journalist i was working in chicago at the end of the Gulf War. And there was a, a huge parade on Michigan Avenue, welcoming home the troops. And the big mantra was, we're not gonna make the same mistakes that we made at the end of the Vietnam War. It's true. I, I would say if there was one durable, and I'm fairly confident lasting um, lesson learned is that we are not gonna blame the veterans anymore. I, I think in some ways that we've exaggerated a little bit the extent to which every veteran was spit upon or or um, called baby killers. But it certainly did happen and it was certainly unfortunate and I think it, it reflected the divisions in those times that are very similar to our times, but our time has been free of that. We have understood how to separate the mistakes of policymakers from from the from the actions of soldiers and um it's a it's a powerful thing. I mean, there's lots of lessons to be learned from Vietnam, and some are learned, um, you know, for a little bit and then forgotten again, and and some were never adopted. But I think, you know, one of the best and more important things is that we came away from there feeling that we were never going to blame our warriors again. It's really powerful to hear um, what Zach is saying because we've heard from so many Vietnam veterans that one of the major disturbing things that happened was the lack of respect that many of you felt from the World War II generation. We have footage of World War II veterans sometimes saying things to Vietnam veterans, you didn't win your war, we won our war. And again, blaming the soldiers, but also this kind of, you know, conflict with the older generation, which is wonderful to hear is not so much the case. We would like to hear, oh, Marcia, go uh, ahead, please. Just, just a comment, um, you know, when you look at the fellows in the field and, and anyone who was in Vietnam, you were lucky to survive. You were lucky to come home without an injury. You were lucky not to come home with a body bag. Your, your daily mission was to stay alive, to survive. And when you got home and to be treated like we were, we were very angry. And that underscored a lot of um, the feelings that can continue to the day. We would like to hear from the uh, the veterans who are uh, here in our live audience here in New York City. Uh, Tim has a microphone here. If you'd like to say something, uh, it can be raw, it can be painful, it can be tearful. Um, we welcome you, sir. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Eric, Sp Eric Spinner. Uh, I'm a resident of Long Island, Nassau County, and listening to all of this, having joined the American Legion about eight years ago, the Legion Riders about seven years ago, and about the same time the Vietnam War Veterans Association of Nassau County, which used to be part of VVA, uh, we go out as Vietnam veterans to many high schools, middle schools, we go out as a veterans group. We get our guys to come out and talk about Vietnam, about the lessons they learned. I was not boots on the ground, but I have a solemn duty to support my brothers in their survival. This is my life for the rest of my life. 
if you've been to Nassau County and seen the veterans' memorials, all of them have wonderful monuments and statues and everything else. But the one that is most impressive and carries the greatest meaning to me is the clasped hands with the dog tags wrapped around them, which is the Vietnam Monument. And the inscription on that monument really says it all. All they had was each other. And this holds true even to this day. And this is why the Vietnam and Vietnam era vets will not let anybody come home without a proper welcome and proper care. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, comments from uh, anyone else? We see uh, some hands going up. Also, for our viewers on uh, Facebook Live, if you have questions or comments, please uh, type them out. We're keeping track in the back, and we will read your questions or comments here in the room. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, John Devine. I served with the Marines, 1st Marine Division, 1st Reconnaissance Battalion. And uh, some of the things that make me angry today, 50 years after the fact, is the difference in benefits that Vietnam veterans are not entitled to. Um, maybe I'm jealous. I lost my entire right leg in Vietnam. And I want to thank the nursing corps over there. You guys, gals were great with the medical people. And um, during my uh, saving life surgery, I got 37 pints of blood, and it's a miracle I'm here. I had a great life ever since then. But um, an Iraqi vet or an Afghanistan vet, if they lose their limb in combat or even home on leave while they're in the service, they get up to $100,000 for uh, their dismemberment. And they put that rule into effect in the early 2000s and grandfathered so all the veterans could get it. I think it's a good idea, but why did they stop there? Why didn't they go back to the people that are injured in training accidents? Military is a very dangerous business. And Vietnam vets, Korean vets, World War II vets. There's also another thing about, I'm not an expert on benefits. I'm just an 18-year-old kid that graduated from high school and joined the Marine Corps. But there's a health care benefit that spouses get, Iraqi veteran spouses get, that nobody else gets. And uh, the GI Bill is much, much better today than it was in our day. I went to college, St. John's University, right here in Queens. And um, all the guys I went to school with there were cab drivers, bartenders, scratching to make it to pay their school. So I, that's what makes me angry now. Um, I just got to tell one other thing about my discharge from the Manhattan VA right here on 24th Street. I'm an Irish Catholic, and I live in Brooklyn. And I had my wheelchair, my crutches, and any other thing I had getting out of that hospital, and I couldn't get a cab. And the guy says to me, where are you going? I go, Brooklyn. He goes, I'm going to Brooklyn. Like that. And like the guy in the video, I wanted to jump on top of that cab and kill this guy. <laughs> I said, I'm a goddamn vet, you know, and he says, right there in front of 24. Fortunately, it didn't take too many other cabs to pass by, and I finally got hooked up with one, and I got home. But there's pain all around for everybody, except for mine. Thank you for my, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Yeah, Sir. Hi. Uh, hi. Yeah, you're good. I'm good. Yeah, my name is Joe Graham. I'm president of Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 126 here in Manhattan. Um, I see here in the audience our national commander, who's done an awful lot, uh, John Rowan, uh, who um, has uh, done an awful lot with health care for, uh, for veterans. He's been uh, on it for many, many years. And a lot of the benefits that we have coming in today, we could thank uh, John and uh, our lobbyists uh, that he has uh, down in Washington. I also see here Commissioner Lori Sutton, who I spent her entire career in the Army, I guess, as uh, dealing with the psychological and the psychiatry. So you have some uh, talented people here that are in the know. I, I would like to point out um, this young man over here from in New York City at Langone, the VA has a terrific program for mental health, not just for the veteran, but for the family as well. And uh, I'd like his 
to be aware of it, and we all should know about it. Um, finally, I would like to say, we, yes, we took care of, we pushed, and when we came home, we were rejected. The, guy, the old timers from World War II in Korea, ah, that's not a war, so on and so forth. We passed all that. Um, and we uh, are supporting these kids that are coming home now from Iraq and Afghanistan. And th the way it looks at this point with this war on terrorism, that's not going to end anytime soon. And I could see where our, these, you, guys that are coming home, your grandchildren will be involved in a war on terrorism. So it really is important that we define what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, identify the enemy. We can't just keep throwing our young men and women uh, in harm's way. And, uh, and then if they come home, they don't have jobs, they don't have... An, and I, I think that, that this... Uh, this uh, war film that you're showing us. I, I haven't seen all of it. I saw it down at uh, uh, previewed in uh, in uh, New Orleans. Um, I've gotten some reactions from some of my fellow vets that eh, it's a little bit tilted. Wet, uh, well, tilted. they haven't seen it yet. Right. So, they, so it'll, it, it starts on Sunday, and, and, and then after it's finished, uh, you know, on the 27th, 28th, then people can criticize it, but it's yeah, not well, a good idea to, to can, listen to criticism yeah, of a I, film I, they haven't I, seen. I know, talking with guys in my chapter, some of them are, are already ready to jump, you know, yeah. and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that it, it is fair and balanced and, and it presents is. it. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your service. Tim, I see a lot of hands going up. Also, um, let me also read a comment from uh, Facebook Live, our audience. Mary Trumbly Scott uh, relays the story of her husband, Greg, who was called a baby killer. One of the first things he did was to throw his uniform away. He was not supposed to be proud of doing what he was supposed to do. Except for his, our families, he was not welcomed home. Finally, in the last few years, he's been thanked for his service, publicly, several times. It makes me cry every time. Finally, in capital letters. Uh, so that's the kind of emotion that, that you're seeing. Well, I don't want to make her cry, but thank you for your service. I'll start here. My name is Bill Krupe. Um, my welcome home was as follows. Um, I'm in my jungle fatigues. We flew into McGuire Air Force Base um, Saturday morning, 4 a.m., July 13th, 1970, but who remembers? Um, they bus us over to uh, the Army side. I was a first lieutenant scheduled to get discharged. They said, well, if you want breakfast, so we had a little breakfast, so we go to the personnel section. Uh, you know, I'm here to get discharged, just come back Monday morning. So here I am standing in my jungle fatigues, my Doppler kit, and I grew up in Brooklyn, and I'm figuring out now how do I get home to Brooklyn. So I went to the PX, put a uh, change of clothes, had to borrow some money from somebody, put my clothes um, in the bag, put my jungle fatigues in the bag, Took a bus from uh, Fort Dix, the Port Authority mm -hmm. bus terminal. Took the subway from Port Authority to my house in Brooklyn, and then my dad drove me back. Monday morning, I got discharged. They said, you know, congratulations, you had a combat tour, you're done with the Army. Uh, two months later, I was back in the Army because I had a reserve commitment. But it wasn't for naught because I wound up staying another... 33 years in the reserves. I spent 36 years, all total. I uh, finished up as a major general in the uh, Army Reserves. And a lot of the things that I learned in Vietnam, and as a leader, you learn, but you also learn if you become a leader, you're not going to do this. So I hope somewhere my Vietnam experience had an influence on a lot of the soldiers over the years. And again, I thank the Iraqi veterans and Desert Storm, Desert Storm uh, veterans. So. Um, the Army's a great institution, but um, they need to learn things sometimes. So thank you very much. General, thank you. The General's Parade was a parade of buses at the Port Authority bus yeah, terminal. Exactly. Getting to the city, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a lovely bus terminal. <laughs> Sir. Hi, right, good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Sean Wade. I'm with the New York City Veterans Alliance. Formerly Sergeant Wade, United States Marine Corps. I was in the first part of Iraq with one MHG. 
Six Communications Battalion fapped us out as their NBC team. Um, I'd like to say everything that you guys are doing, my, my hero growing up, his name was Herbie Santana. He was an 0331 in Vietnam. He was my idol. Unfortunately, those scars wound him up in jail. He wound up in the criminal justice system. He lost his family. He lost his freedom through no fault of his own. He tells stories of how he used to come home from the Bronx and he got home on 4th of July and the fireworks had him diving down into the basement apartment as he's walking down the street. Uh, fast forward, uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work. The gentleman in the back spoke of NYU. His name is Jared Sturk. He is a friend of mine. That program is fantastic. I haven't heard of Petrong until today, but I will be contacting you. I also belong to Marines of New York. For all the Marines in the room, please feel free. We'll exchange information after. It's a great organization of us just getting together just to talk because nobody understands us but us. Um, with that said, uh, if you haven't heard the expression, the world is great except it's draped in camouflage. Although we're coming out, we're admitting that we have these things, we have our demons, we have our scars. And I'm happy to see the commissioner in the room because New York City has a major issue. Uh, you're trying to use PTSD to take away our families, to break apart our families and take away our kids. I've personally gone through it. And we do our part. We step up. I still volunteer with CERT, FEMA, New York City. New York City called previous 9-11. We had a bombing in Chelsea. I was there myself as a volunteer. But I wasn't allowed to see my son because I had PTSD. Commissioner, ACS is an issue. Please look into it. They're using PTSD against veterans, not trying to help us. I look forward to uh, engaging everyone further. My name again is Sean Wade. I am with the New York City Alliance. Vets are rising. Please keep it up. Our generation, your generation, the next generation. We need to stick together, work together, and face this together. That's how we survive combat. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's powerful. Each of these stories is powerful. And, and I, I think, Sean, you made a, a great point that when we're done here, when the microphones are turned off and the cameras are turned off and the, and the lights are turned down, you can all mingle. Everybody here on stage, everybody in the audience can, can meet and commiserate and connect. And I, I think that's really important. That, and that's going to be, I think, one of the great things that's going to come out of this room uh, today is, is the fact to, that you can meet people perhaps you haven't met before. Can, can I ask a question from the side of the room? And that Please. is... 10 years ago when the two of you decided to do this film, was this what you're hoping would be part of it? Um, first, we just wanted to try to figure out what happened in the Vietnam War. And as we did in our film on the Second World War, we thought, you know, there are still people living who remembered it, and we wanted to really understand what that war was actually like, not the arrows on the map. We wanted to know where those arrows were pointing, but what was it like to be a human being in the middle of this cataclysm? And so we, we spent a lot of time talking to those veterans and trying to really, our idea was that you could honor their service in World War II by not sort of sugarcoating the realities of war, but actually telling it like it was. And so we sort of carried that to another level with Vietnam because this generation of veterans is much more um, willing, I think, to talk about those things in great detail and some of the inner conflicts that have come out here just bubbled to the surface both here and in Vietnam because we also spoke to Vietnamese veterans and heard their stories and some of them, many of them struggle with the same things that American veterans struggle with but without any infrastructure whatsoever to help. And yeah, we, you know, the idea that one of the things John Musgrave said at that meeting was you have to tell your story. And there are medical treatments, absolutely, but there's also the sense if you bottle things up, it doesn't do you any good. So, you know, without being medical clinicians, I guess we hope that our film creates a, a space within the film for people to share their stories and that that then, as we've seen in screenings when people have seen it, want to speak more and talk more about what they've been through. And this is an extraordinarily an incredible event today just to see a little bit of what can happen. Ken? I, I, I agree with Lynn completely. I, I think we're all pretty lonely. Just that's the human condition. And we kind of yearn for connection with each other and 
these kinds of experiences, which are so other from everyday experiences, make it even harder for veterans to connect. Uh, it's so good that they the the fellowship is felt war to war, service branch to service branch uh, among those um, veterans that, that at least feel that they have some sort of family. And I, I think with all the films we've made, even those that are not a, a, about war specifically, that what we're looking for is how we might take a whole set of individual stories and tie them together to tell an American story and understand that it isn't just one story, that it's many stories, has lots of different um, aspects to it. And that somehow that we, if we could create a vessel in which so many different points of view and sets of experiences could coexist, you'd have that ability to begin to replicate community. So I, I think that Lynn is absolutely right. What we first had to do was spend 10 years just struggling to just master the story we were going to tell. But then finally, when it's over, you begin to realize that, that maybe it does have a, a, a possibility of bringing us together, that we do have too much pluribus and not enough unum in the United States, as the historian Arthur Schlesinger once said, and that, that we ought to, all of us, in our own way, as much as we can, with each other's help, um, be about unum and not about that individual sort of loneliness that 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 is just so disconnecting some of us can't help it some of us do that isolation but that's where our responsibility comes to reach out to one another and try to tell our stories share these narratives connect with new generations that these narratives will seem very familiar to even though they're unique to this um, particular war they also bear a a remarkable similarity to what we've heard from Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, and in fact, back to the World War II generation. So I, I just hope the film in some ways does that. Roger Harris. Yeah, I wanted to respond to the gentleman back there who said something about um, some folks in New Orleans saw the film and they, they were critical of it. Um, as I mentioned, I was real fortunate once I got back. I was able to go to school, and I committed myself to working with youth. I promised God when I was in Vietnam that if I made it back, I'd dedicate my life to working with youth. And I, I just retired after 42 years in, in Boston Public Schools. I've been a classroom teacher, football, basketball, track coach. I've been dean of discipline. I've been assistant headmaster, principal, and, 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 and superintendent. I've been Massachusetts Principal of the Year, National Distinguished Principal. I've been a college professor and faculty director. So I know a little bit about, about teaching, and kids, and every time I see these episodes, and I've seen maybe eight, I haven't seen all of them, I learned something, and it's like going to graduate school. And I hope that we don't get caught up in this thing about trying to criticize the documentary instead of looking at it as, as, a, as, a, as a life lesson, because there are so many deep lessons in there. We've been talking about the personal stories of soldiers, but this is the most comprehensive documentary on a war I've ever seen. They not only cover the personal lives of, of, of American soldiers, but Vietnamese soldiers, but they cover four presidencies and have the secret tapes uh, and the politics of, of war, uh, the, the Gold Star families, uh, the, 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 the anti-war movement, and then the politics over in Vietnam. And so the, it's probably the most comprehensive documentary on a war you'll ever see, but but there are lessons to learn from this. There are many, many lessons to learn from this. And, and because we were the folks who were the pawns in the game, we were, we were the soldiers, you know, we tend to look at life like that, but we need to look at it at, at, from a different perspective. And one of the lessons that should be learned from this film should be a lesson learned by the policymakers. And policymakers need to understand that they need to, they need to practice respectful diplomacy, respectful diplomacy before they rattle sabers and send people's sons off to fight, you know? And so take time, get to watch it. Don't listen to what somebody says about it. Watch it yourself and draw your own conclusions. But, but this is something that, something, this, this documentary, and I'm not saying it because I'm in it, because my piece is a little piece, you know? Uh, but, but this is something that, that no one has ever done before. Hold on to the mic, uh, just because I want to follow up with that. We do, we do have more people in the audience who are going to have uh, questions. The hands are going up. But, Roger, I want to ask you, first of all, you're underselling yourself. You're more than just a minor piece <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this puzzle. Uh, but when the discussion came up of we're making a documentary, the Vietnam War, and we want you to be a part of it, 
what were your initial thoughts? Were were you excited? Were you like, are you crazy doing this? What um, that, that did you think it was work? Did you think it would work? That wasn't that wasn't how I got involved. <laughs> I got a call. There was an organization in Boston called the VBC, the Veterans Benefits Clearinghouse. And uh, some of my friends were very active with that. I wasn't. I was very active in Boston public schools. And I got a call one evening from one of my friends who, who, who was with the VBC. And he said, there are some filmmakers, never mentioned Ken Burns. He said, there are some filmmakers who want to talk to some veterans. They want to do a film on the Vietnam War. Do you have time to come down and, and meet with them? And, you know, for me, school with the kids were, were the priority, and so I said, I'll try to. And when I got there, uh, Lynn was there, and, and Sarah Boston was there, and there were about 26 black and Latino veterans in the room at, a, at the Boston Neighborhood Network news station. And I thought that this was going to be a film about blacks in Vietnam. I didn't know what it was going to be, you know? And when I walked he in... He came in late. That's why yeah. he missed our little spiel at the beginning. <laughs> But, and, 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 and what I heard was uh, Sarah, Sarah wanted, uh, no, Lynn wanted folks to go around the room and talk for about five or six minutes about their experience. And as the talks moved around the room, I sat at the table and I told my story. And then I told a piece of my story. And then, I don't know, months later, I got contacted and asked if, uh, if I'd be willing to meet uh, to talk, to, to, to give an in-depth uh, interview. Um, with them, but I never knew that it was a Ken Burns film. I didn't know who Florentine Films was. I didn't know it was going to be the Vietnam War. I think three years later, someone came to my house. They called me and asked if I had pictures of my child, my home when I grew up, and and pictures of um, of in Vietnam and after Vietnam. And I said, sure, I do. And they said, well, could you send them to us in New York? And I said, no, uh, I'm, I'm, no, no, they're personal. And they said, well, can we come to your house and scan them? And I said, no, I'm leaving for China in, in two days. You know? And they said, we'll be at your house tomorrow. And the gentleman came up and spent, yeah, it was, Luke, was it Lucas? Lucas. He came up and he spent about three hours in my house scanning pictures. And I said, hey, what is this thing anyway? Am, am, am I, is, am I going to be in it? What's it called, Blacks in Vietnam? And he said, no, 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 no. It's, it's bigger than that. He said, it's bigger than, he said, since we've talked to you, he said, we've been to Vietnam and we've talked to soldiers who fought in the same battles. He said, I don't know what we're going to call it, but it's really big. You know, so I, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. But what, I'll tell you the truth. Um, the interview that, that you see, it was, you know, what, six years ago, five years ago. Um, in Boston, they asked why I was willing to, to, to speak about, you know, my experiences there. And, and the truth is, um, it was because of Lynn. Lynn's interviewing style, you know, they just made us feel real comfortable. And, um, and so I want to thank you, you know, for that. Thank you. We can't begin to thank you. It's not possible. Sir. Uh, thank you both. Uh, I believe that uh, this film will be important 500 years from now. And um, I'm, my name is Dominic Yezo, and I, I serve as the, the uh, chairperson for veterans incarcerated and in the justice system with the Vietnam Veterans of America. My platform is PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Um, and I, I, I want to um, bring that into the conversation because my idea is to join with uh, the returning soldiers, and I want to thank you for what you've done. And I want to thank you for your time in combat. I appreciate that, and I understand it. Uh, actually, I was wounded off of Camp Evans, and I went through Marshall Ford's unit. Now, she doesn't remember me, but I remember her. Oh. Uh. 143. <laughs> <laughs> he was one pretty face. In the <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, the actions of, uh, of war um, that are righteous, um, um, they trouble us later. They bruise our souls. And so the idea of, of um, PTSD, which has become a household word because of uh, John Rowan and the Vietnam Veterans of America, and the idea of traumatic brain injury, which has become a study, and not because of soldiers, but because of the NFL, uh, uh, where there were concussions that were serious, um, uh, are now um, terms that we can we can talk about for real. And sometimes the way these manifest is, is that young soldiers who return who did not have the same dignity of a family that I had when I came home, 
because my parents waited for me. I returned on the day that Woodstock was on. There were 500,000 soldiers in Vietnam and 500,000 students and musicians in, and, and others uh, in the field in, in, in upstate New York. It was, it was an incredible day, August 17th, 2000, uh, 1969. And um, the dichotomy was unintended. The irony was unintended, but it was real. I hope you get to see our film because we did exactly that calculus and realized, well, a half a million young men and women were overseas fighting. A half a million young men and women were listening to this music. And we try to intercut and kind of forge both absurd and very real connections between those two events. I have seen part of the film, and it, it, it demonstrates uh, a nation in turmoil, clearly. Uh, but my, 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 my push right now, uh, quickly, is, is to let, let all of us know that sometimes returning with, with the trouble of PTSD, which is unknown, and the trouble of traumatic brain injury, which is unknown, uh, causes um, our soldiers causes her to make a bad decision, causes him to make a bad decision. That bad decision uh, could uh, result in uh, getting uh, arrested. And at the point of arrest, I'm very interested in that soldier. Um, four months ago, that was a sergeant serving uh, perhaps two Purple Hearts and uh, serving with honor mission oriented, who's now returned home and perhaps didn't return home to the kind of structure that you might need as a soldier. Um, and um, soon the respect is gone, and soon you are alone. Everyone is always alone. And, and uh, perhaps you start to drink or to self-medicate or to use drugs or worse. And at the point of arrest, when that happens, uh, I want to be sure that that veteran is transferred or assigned to a special court which is known as a veterans treatment court, um, so that we can treat that person as a soldier, give that person the dignity, get the VA in there to help them with alcoholism or drug addiction or, or anger management, whatever it is, um, and give that person another chance. I guarantee you, if there was a veteran treatment court when we came back from Vietnam, we would have saved perhaps 50, 60, thousand who are now incarcerated. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the thank work you of very much. Thank you. Yeah. Marcia? Just to um, you know, play off of that a little bit is that I, I want to make clear the fact that people understand that Vietnam Veterans of America, it doesn't just work for Vietnam veterans in America. Um, we're an organization who fully encompasses all veterans, and that the work we do really at this point in time is multi-generational moving forward. And so many of the projects we have and the legislation and things we work on is not just about Vietnam veterans. Yeah. Thank you. And we have uh, someone in the audience. I'm going to stand up because uh, if I'm sitting, people don't see me anyhow. My name is Linda Schwartz, and I uh, was an Air Force nurse during the Vietnam War. I took care of casualties. As they left, I was stationed in Japan. And I am a lifetime member of Vietnam Veterans of America. And I had the honor to serve as the Assistant Secretary of Veterans Affairs for Policy and Planning. And I just wanted to bring up, when you asked the question of Marsha about people becoming aware of post-traumatic stress uh, a, 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 as battle casualties, uh, when we got them maybe a day or maybe half a day later, and they began to think about going home, it was a daunting task for many of them. And I can tell you that especially some of them who had thought they might have plans were really derailed by their, their injuries. But I want to also speak for a moment about the nurses in Vietnam who were our heroes. 60% of the nurses in Vietnam, for 60% of them, this was their very first job in nursing. They went right from nursing school to the battlefield. And for years, not until 1992, the, Viet the Veterans Administration would not recognize the fact that these young women who took care of casualties day in and day out, they were not allowed to have the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress because they were not in combat. And some research projects that we worked on were able to demonstrate that the kinds of things that these nurses saw all along the route back to the United States were indeed 
of the category to cause post-traumatic stress. And so when I look at the, the casualties today and I hear about them, um, and that now they, it is recognized what is post-traumatic stress, I think that we have accomplished a great deal. But I do think our hats have to continually go off to the nurses who served in Vietnam. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Ruben Pratt. I served in the Marine Corps also. I am a Tet 68 survivor. I served at, uh, right outside Da Nang when we got hit that night. Uh, my welcome home, similar to all, all of you guys, from Vietnam all the way over, over and over, airport to airport. I got to JFK. I waited, my family was late. So I went upstairs to make a phone call. I looked out the door, the glass, car pull up, and I see these ladies get out. I'm looking at them. So I go upstairs. I said, no, let me go talk to these ladies. I turn around, here they come. It was my sister and sister-in-law. I didn't recognize them. I thought I was going to get lucky. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I guess most of you guys understand this. <laughs> uh, at the airport, there was these two older ladies who welcomed me home. So I had a different welcome home than most of my brothers. Uh, no one really spat at me. No one yelled at me. No one called me a baby killer. So I guess I'm one of the rare ones, and it hurts me that uh, this did happen to a lot of my brothers as they came home, and probably the ladies, too. Uh, this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Dan McSweeney. I'm with the United War Veterans Council. Um, I want to thank uh, Ken and Lynn for what is going to be a very important project because it makes real, it provides a visceral connection with the experience of the men and women that were in Vietnam. And the reason I say that's so important is we are at risk when, when we have an all-volunteer force and when really 1% of the population of America at any one moment in time is serving, we have that ongoing risk of having the division between the military and the broader community. And after 16 years of war that will be going on forever, as Joe Graham said, we can't let fatigue with veteran stories emerge in our country. We can't do that because that is the beginning of the dismantlement uh, of our structure, right? The military serves such a vital function. So it's so important for a film like this for other creative projects, and especially for community organizing as manifested in parades and other types of events like that that really bring the experience and put it front and center in communities. It's so important for that to occur. So I just want to say thank you as a Marine vet who served in Iraq. This is such an important project, and I thank you for, for completing it. I thank you. You know, we, we really... We really feel that we've tried to cover all of the stories of Vietnam, and, and not many of them are pleasant. But I think one of the things that we wanted to make sure is the understanding that most of the soldiers went over there and acquitted themselves honorably and came back home and have you know tried to come back and be productive members of society. And I think a good deal of the mythology of Vietnam, promoted by movies and sort of superficial things that gets veterans in advance of anybody seeing anything but a clip or two uh, worried about the, the series. But I, I, I think that we hope that it will, it will go a long way towards honoring and, as I said before, saying welcome home and how can we help. Okay. We're actually starting to come uh, to the end of our, our time together. The conversations can certainly uh, continue uh, after we're done with, with this program. But to end it, I'd like each of our guests, maybe, and we'll, we'll start with, uh, with Roger, uh, just to say a few words uh, in conclusion, and, and we'll, we'll go around. I just want to thank everyone who has uh, served in the military. And I had asked a question earlier under my breath. Are there any Navy corpsmen out there? Navy corpsmen, corpsmen? You know, the Marines don't have their own medical folks, so the Navy get assigned to us. You know, their training is not like ours, but they, they trudge with us, you know. <laughs> you know. So I, I just wanted to thank them, if any, any corpsmen were here. But, uh, but all the vets, thank you, and, and thank the families, uh, the Gold Star families who sacrificed. And um, 
and hopefully um, this film will be a lesson for America. Thank you, Roger. Marcia Four. I'm I'm certainly waiting to see the whole piece put together, only having seen little clips. There's so much more to it, and it's, I believe, going to be a tremendous um, opportunity for so many people to get a further understanding of much of the politics and the such that went on before, during, and after the war. I um. I have always, I've said to my children, before when I die, I want you to go through all my stuff and read it because there's so much about me you do not know. And I'm and I told them they all have to videotape DVR this on their TV so that they can watch this. The one thing that I feel about my service, which I'm very proud of. I knew I wasn't born to live in the Army for 30 years, but I'm very proud of what I did. I know that at the end of my days, I was a part of something much greater than myself. Thank you. We heard somebody call for you to write a book. Write it yourself. Would you consider that? <laughs> yeah. We'd all like to read it. Yeah. Oh, I bet. <laughs> There's lots of good stories. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Zach Iskell from Headstrong. Um, I don't have much more to add. Uh, you know, I think the the one thing that I hope people leave, um, if they they remember anything that I've said, is that if if uh, if you can't sleep at night, if you're having panic attacks, anxiety, um, you're having issues with your wife, issues with your husband, issues at work, um, you know, these are things that are treatable. And if you get the right help, um, you can get better. So get Headstrong.org. Uh, we're in New York, Chicago. Houston, San Diego, Los Angeles, DC, um, Denver, Colorado Springs, <laughs> Boston, Mass General, and the Red Sox have a great program. <laughs> you heard it here. Thank you. Getheadstrong.org. And even if you're not in one of those cities, you can still log on. You can, and, and our team will try and help you find the right services if we're not able to provide them. All right, Zach, thank you very much. Lynn Novick. Wow, well, it's um, Ken and I have been on the road for the last six months trying to explain our film with that to people who haven't yet seen it and tried to honor the service of the people who served and foster reconciliation and dialogue. And this today has been really kind of overwhelming, frankly, to see all of you here and to hear your stories, which reminds us all the stories we weren't able to tell and everyone has a story. So um, just thank you for being here and for speaking so frankly with us today. Um, I was sort of thinking, what am I going to say? What could I possibly say to sum up anything that there's not that much more to say? But we came across a quote after we finished the film from a Vietnamese-American writer, and he said, all wars are fought twice, in the battlefield and in our memory. And it has seemed to us why we made the film is that we're still sort of haunted by Vietnam and fighting about how we remember it. And we, we just hope that our film can maybe shift that course a little bit and what happened today here is certainly a good indication of that, so thank you. Thank you. Ken Burns? I, I think Lynn said it exactly. Uh, we've been on the road for an awful long time trying to talk about a film that we can't really show. Every single evening I tease people that we're just going to lock the doors and show them all 18 hours, so the kinds of misunderstandings uh, ahead of time before the broadcast on Sunday the 17th and then continuing for a couple of weeks after that, that people don't misunderstand our intentions or misread it. There'll be parts where you'll be uncomfortable. There'll be parts where you'll be overjoyed that that's being told. And there'll be parts where you're just scratching your head going, I don't know how to make sense of any of this. And, and that's the story of the war. A couple of nights ago, we were in a city um, a, a bit south of here, and we were had a panel not dissimilar to this after we showed 45 minutes of clips, and we had some, you know, an enlisted man, and we had um, a Navy lieutenant, and we had a captain in, in the uh, um, Navy Air Force, and um, they were just talking, and they'd had a range of experience, and Lynn and I were just sort of shutting up because it was like today, we were dwarfed and in awe of the kind of experiences they had, and and um, the Navy pilot had been um, captured and shot down and captured and spent a long time tortured and and got home. And he hadn't seen all the film, but he'd seen enough of it that he gave us the highest compliment, which he said, um, I think this film is going to heal things. 
I think it's going to heal things, which is obviously what we need to do. Um, one of the soldiers that we were sitting with was a man named Chuck Hagel, who went on to become the Secretary of Defense. Um, the young Navy man was um, Lieutenant John Kerry, and the guy who was a prisoner was John McCain. And um, we, we sort of felt that at that moment, the film stopped being uh, ours and started being all of yours. And so once again, welcome home. How can we help? Uh, the Vietnam War debuts Sunday evening on PBS. Uh, set your DVRs uh, to record. We'd like to thank all of our, uh, our panelists for being here today, our guests. And thank you all of you who are here in our live studio audience here in New York City, and also to everybody who's been watching this on Facebook Live. Uh, you've been a big part of it as well. We thank you very much. We hope you learned something, gained some understanding, um, and, and feel good about the discussion. Uh, again, thank you very much. And to those of you watching on Facebook Live, thank you for watching.